Welcome to this edition of the Marty Chronicles, part of the Conservative Take platform. I'm Marty Nahots. Thanks for viewing this episode. I live in a very small town in southwestern Pennsylvania. It's close to the area where Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia meet. Very small town. And as I've, to as I've tooled around the past few days, there's a couple of things that stand out to me. Number one, gas, over $4 a gallon. The all-time record for Pennsylvania is $4.08. So we're approaching that. Groceries. I went to the grocery store the other day, bought $115 worth of groceries and carried them all in in one trip, which never happens. And the other thing is everywhere I go, everybody's short-staffed. Nobody can hire people no matter what wages they're paying. There's fast food restaurants around here offering $17 an hour to start. So to kind of make sense of that, I invited Krista Huff to join me on this episode. Krista is a hedge fund and portfolio manager outside of Denver, Colorado, been doing it for about 30 years. She's been doing this with stocks and bonds. Her stock reviews have been seen in Forbes, Town Hall, and other outlets. And that's all great. That's important. But there's another reason why I asked Krista to join me. Krista has a political insight to go along with that that's it's very important, I believe, in this day and age. Some of you will remember a few years ago, there was a really nasty piece of legislation floating around called TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Had that passed, I, I would argue that things would be a lot worse today than they already are. That was defeated, and there were a lot of grassroots people involved, but I don't think it's stay, overstating it to say that Crystal led that charge. So let me bring Krista in, and we'll get going on this. Krista, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Marty. Good to see you. You too. Let's start with inflation. Um, I, I already mentioned a few things. What's driving this crazy inflation right now? Well, um, I would say it all started with the COVID lockdowns, when the government got involved in telling businesses what they can and can't do. And, you know, we lost hundreds of thousands of small businesses, literally went out of business because they couldn't survive the lockdowns and everything just sort of uh, snowballed from there. Uh, so we have skyrocketing uh, oil prices. And part of that has to do with the very recent problems in Russia and Ukraine, but also um, from a year ago when Joe Biden uh, changed America's energy independence so drastically, shut down the Keystone pipeline, uh, made it more difficult um, to uh, lease uh, federal lands for oil production, um, went back into the cl Paris Climate Agreement. Many different things are contributing to the current oil prices. So right now, West Texas crude is at 115 a barrel. In December, it was at it was just at $65 a barrel. So you can see the massive increase there. And, you know, just uh, everything is sort of, um, the planets are converging, as they say, and, it, and it's ugly. Let me back up for just a second. Something you mentioned, and that's the influence of COVID on, on our economic situation today. Um, just recently, there was, I think, a horrible document drop from Pfizer that... Um, mm -hmm really brought out some horrible parts of the vaccinations and, and things like that. But forget about that for a second. Have we seen the full impact of COVID on inflation and things like that? I mean, we gave away money. The government gave away money. The government right. paid people not to work. There was all right. this talk. I don't know if it's true or not. Maybe you do. But there was all this talk that hospitals were being paid extra to oh, yeah. diagnose people with COVID. It, have we seen the, the real impact of all that yet, or is that still to come? Well, I think it, it's still ongoing. I think hospitals are still being paid to uh, diagnose people as COVID and to treat them in certain ways. Hospitals get paid a lot more money to put someone on a ventilator than to give them uh, vitamins, ivermectin, et cetera. So as long as the government is dictating what companies do, um, things will continue to spiral out of control. We need to let the free markets um, stabilize themselves without constant government interference. Yeah, for sure. There's no question about that. 
Let's talk about supply chains for just a minute. We take we hear about the supply chain problem in America today. How serious is that? Uh, the supply chain problem has been drastic, and it's what and um, it's exacerbated by labor shortages. Like you said, people were paid to stay home, and they have not flocked back into the workforce. Um, I personally know people who are sitting at on their laurels at home because they got paid to do so. They even quit jobs so that they could get paid to stay home. It, it's not a good situation. Um, we have um, rising costs, um, uh, rising wages, uh, many different things that are contributing to supply chain problems. But the inflation problem isn't just supply chain because things that are outside the supply chain like rent are also skyrocketing. Medical costs are very high and that's relatively outside the supply chain. So we can't just fix supply chain problems and voila, inflation goes away. It's a, it's a bigger problem. I, I, just before we started, I was reading something, I haven't confirmed this, so I don't wanna really go too far with it, but I read part of an article suggesting that China um, approached Russia three months before this conflict started to uh -huh. adjust their supply chain with them. Have you heard that? No, I do read that China is actually a much bigger problem in general than Russia, and Russia is more of a distraction. I mean, Russia is serious, but China is like a bigger, longer term problem, and I don't doubt that. Um, so, for, for example, when I invest, I never touch any Chinese stock because you can't trust anything the Chinese tell us. So, for example, there was a um, there was a Chinese uh, coffee chain, and it was all the rage. They were comparing it to Starbucks. All the investors wanted to buy it. And when I was still writing a stock market newsletter, I was assigned to cover this uh, Chinese uh, retail coffee chain. And by looking at the numbers, I realized immediately that the numbers were being faked. And um, I actually it actually led to me. Uh, losing a large part of my salary because at that moment I refused to write any further about Chinese stocks. So they took away a third of my salary um, because of, because I was getting rid of some work obligations. Well, the long and the short of it was two months later, Luck and Coffee uh, finally announced that they had been cooking the books and uh, the stock completely plummeted. And that's just typical of any information we get out of China. You can't trust it. So I refuse to invest in, in anything Chinese. And, um, and I'm always appalled when people want to invest in Chinese companies. Another area China might come into play is with regards to our debt, our national debt. We are over $30 trillion in, in U.S. debt. And comparatively, I believe our GDP is about $21 trillion. It's in the low 20s, somewhere in there. Now, that's been manageable so far because the interest rates are so low. But everything I'm reading is that we're probably, if not absolutely, looking at uh, several Fed rate hikes this year. So when, if or when that happens, all of a sudden that $30 trillion debt, a lot of which goes to the Chinese, it becomes far more important. Am I right in that? Um, if we were issuing a lot of new debt, we would have to issue it at higher interest rates and then the U.S. is on the hook to pay more interest on debt than they have been in the past. Um, however, I don't think uh, that the Federal Reserve plans to issue any more debt after March. Or let me just say that uh, Jerome Powell, Fed ch chairman, has said that he's not going to issue more debt after March. As a matter of fact, they're planning to let a lot of the debt start to just expire without replacing it in the near future. And in order to get inflation under control, they're probably going to have to go farther and actually sell some of the bonds in the Treasury. So if you can picture when the when the Federal Reserve and the news organizations talk about the Fed balance sheet, think of it as your Schwab account. You've got your investment account, maybe some stocks, bonds, mutual funds. So the Fed's balance sheet is similar to your Schwab uh, investment portfolio. The Fed owns a whole bunch of U.S. treasuries and other kinds of debt, and they actually uh, dramatically increased the amount they owned in recent years. And, and now they 
And now that inflation is a problem, what they need to do is start selling some of their bonds. And as they sell the bonds, that should push bond prices down and interest rates would rise. If that all comes to pass, would that have an impact on that, that interest debt that the government has to pay? Uh, no, be I don't. I don't see that because the current interest that the that's on the Fed balance sheet is fi at a fixed rate. So if it was at an adjustable rate, that would be a big problem. Now, uh, consumers, if they have um, credit cards, most credit cards are adjustable rate, and as interest rates rise, the amount of interest you pay on your debt increases. So it. Right now, interest rates are rising, and, and, and I'm guessing interest rates are going to be rising for several years. So that's very difficult for homeowners who have adjustable rate mortgages. It's difficult for literally anyone who has um, a credit card because they're going to start to own money. And it's difficult for anybody who plans to buy a home in the near future because um, as interest rates rise, uh, you get to... Um, your, your monthly payments either rise or you're spending much less money on a house because maybe before with low interest rates, you could afford a $500,000 house. But as interest rates rise, that number drops to 400,000, 350, 300, uh, makes a big difference. We've talked about things that impact us individually, the price of gas, the price of groceries. What about housing? Do you, do you see any, so, any sort of real estate bubble coming? Well, <sighs> You know, you and I have lived through these real estate bubbles where um, real estate values rise rapidly. And it's really the same exact thing as when stocks rise rapidly. When stock prices rise rapidly, um, we inevitably get a stock market correction and prices go down a bit or they plummet, just depending on the nature of the correction. Well, the same exact thing happens in any investment market, whether it's precious metals or tulips in Holland or housing. So we have recently seen house prices uh, go up incredibly. So we're at a point where the only place for them to go at this point is down. Um, and with interest rates rising and it becoming more expensive to buy a house in the near future, um, I uh, clearly expect um, a big drop in housing problem uh, prices and in commercial real estate. And I'm actually invested in a bearish manner in that area. In commercial real estate. Yes. Yeah. I don't know with what we've seen in the past few years with the various riots in the big cities. I would hate to own commercial real estate right now. And so many people <laughs> post pandemic aren't, aren't working in those downtown buildings anymore. They're just, they found, right. I have a brother that's an engineer, and he worked in downtown Pittsburgh for a long time. Uh, when this all hit, they sent them all home to work, and that company found out that, you know what, it's actually just as effective, if not more effective, having them work from home. So mm -hmm. they have never called those people back to those offices, and um, I've got to believe that has a long-term effect you know, on, on commercial real estate. Right. You've probably got lots of... Um, investors who own commercial real estate right now, and they've probably been taking a loss because far fewer people and companies are, uh, you know, booking new retail space or corporate space. And as investors go back to the workforce versus working from home, I think fewer of them will go back into the office and more of them will remain working at home. Like you said, it's, it's working out. I work from home. I've been working at home for a decade. So, um, I think that the trend on commercial real estate is going to be that there's less of a demand for it. And so unless they can find something new and different to do with all of that office space, um, between the lower demand and the higher interest rates uh, on, on the loans, because they don't buy the commercial real estate outright, they get loans just like you and I might get for a house. So all of that, um, I think, is going to work to harm the value of commercial real estate. And just for the record, personally, this is just me personally, I don't think it's actually a horrible thing that a lot of people aren't going back into the office. That's kind of the evolution of, of business. They found out that you got those business, those buildings in the 1950s and the 1960s, and that's kind of how you did it. There's a more effective way to, in a lot of cases, there's a more effective way to do it today. They don't need that space anymore. So by itself, 
that doesn't bother me. That's part of this new paradigm in, in business. And it's not a bad thing. Business changes all the time. Where companies get in trouble is when they refuse to adapt to those new opportunities, if that makes sense. Right. Um, you know, my business is on my computer. So anywhere I go, I just bring my computer and I'm actually uh, embarking on a road trip on Sunday, uh, tomorrow. So I'll just bring my computer with me and I'm going to be working from New York for a couple of months and then I'll come back to Colorado. And, you know, if I wanted to go to Alaska, I just bring my job with me. It's pretty simple. Right. Wait, that's what I'm saying. That's the evolution of doing business. And that is in, in many ways a good thing. Uh, Krista, last question for you. Generally speaking, um, we've talked about inflation, gas prices, potential real estate issues. Generally speaking, where should people be putting their money? What should they be looking at now? Um, this is a, this is a tough question because I'm coming at it from the point of view of a, a person who's a relative expert versus almost anyone else who would be listening listening to our conversation. So what I have done is I have invested um, bearishly on stocks and bonds. That means I expect stocks and bond prices to fall, and I invested in such a way to make money as stock and bond prices fall. I invested mm -hmm. bullish on the VIX, and that means I think that there's going to be increased stock market volatility, and I will uh, gain profit as that volatility increases. And then, of course, if I'm wrong and volatility goes down, then I lose money. Um, I have been invested bullish on uh, precious metals and oil prices, meaning I expect them to rise and I will make money as they rise, and that's working out well. And I have been invested bearish on commercial real estate, expecting those prices to fall. But what can the average person do? Um, I think older people understand that we are in a very difficult and different economic time than we may have um, lived through during, for example, previous uh, recessions, previous stock market corrections, I would be more cautious than usual. So if you wanted to, if you think stocks are going to fall, it's pretty easy to move that money into cash. Most people have mutual funds, um, especially in retirement plans where there aren't even any tax consequences from, move, from moving from stocks or bonds into cash. You just move the money into the money market fund. The difficult part is that most investors don't know when to move back into the stock or bonds markets and they miss the boat, right? Um, so while I will certainly do that, I can't really encourage other people to do that knowing in advance that they're going to probably, what happens is after they, they witness the markets fall, they get paralyzed with fear and that's why they don't move back in. So it, it's a tough one, but... I wouldn't be in, in stocks or bonds expecting them to go up right now. Okay. And, and historically, the stock market does correct itself. But again, historically, the trend, if you can or will wait, the trend is upward. Even after there is a correction, it, it goes back. Uh, at, right. If you look at like a 100-year chart of the S&P 500 index, Yes, it, it marches upward, sort of like in a two steps forward, one step back scenario. So I guess the people who have to be most careful right now are the people who might need to spend that money in the very near future. For example, if, if that money is in a kid's college fund and your kid is in high school, I'd be moving that into cash. Um, but if you, if you don't plan to spend that money for 20 years and you really would rather just leave it in stocks, then just leave it in stocks. Yeah, it'll go down you know, short term, but eventually it'll go back up and probably keep rising just as it has during the last hundred years. You, you've got to have right? I, at one time, was a notorious day trader, and that's uh -huh. my personality. I'm very hyper, and um, I would watch it all day long. Long term, that's going to that's gonna destroy you, so you can't do that right, long term. Right. But and if you I can, <laughs> it's a horrible idea. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Krista, you use Substack, correct? How can people find yes. what you're writing on Substack? Okay, so Substack is a blog for writers, and if and I write about lots of different topics: politics, the virus, the vaccine, um, economics, stocks, etc. If they go to KristaHuff.substack.com, 
uh, they can subscribe for free. If you hit the subscribe button, then when I write something, it goes into your email inbox. You've been happy with that platform. Yeah, I've written in many different platforms over the years and by far I like Substack the best. Yes. And it's Krista free Huff, for the writer. It's free. Krista Huff, thank you for joining me today to talk about these issues. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a safe trip and everything goes well for you in New York. Thank you, Marty. Thank you very much. You've been watching the Marty Chronicles on the conservative take. See you next time.